Understanding the apparatus used for electrical circuits for doing lab work, that is very necessary. We have over here a battery eliminator. We need a battery for every circuit that we need to use for any purpose in the lab. The battery eliminator over here, the name suggests that instead of using a cell or a battery, you can easily use this. There is a plug attached to this which goes into the main socket and the output is taken from these two. Because there is a DC output from here, you have a positive and a negative terminal. We have to be always careful and sure that we connect the right way. There is a knob provided in this which allows us to choose from 2 volts to 12 volts output. A pilot lamp which suggests that the eliminator is in working condition and on and off switch to allow us to choose when we wish to use the eliminator and when we need to turn it off that is always when we are not making use of the circuit. Other than this there is this input which is connected with a fuse and in case the eliminator is not working one of the surest problems is that the fuse must have gone. One of the important things that we need for making up a circuit in the lab is a connecting wire. What should be the property of a connecting wire? One, that it should not contribute any resistance so that the entire circuit resistance changes. So it should be that of zero resistance. Nothing can be of that, but we can try and make it as low as possible. The second important requirement for a connecting wire is that it should not give you any shocks, which means it should be insulated enough. The commonly used connecting wires in our labs are made up of copper. Copper is expensive and we should not waste any. So, cut the wire of the required length and use it in the circuit. How do we use it in the circuit? The wire end has to be clean. It should be the insulation which is provided by just putting a thread on it should be removed. The exposed portion should be straightened and cleaned with the sandpaper. What happens to copper is that some oxides develop on it and because of that the connection may not be there or it may change the value of resistance at the terminal point of connection. So clean this section with sandpaper, just doing it two or three times is sufficient. Thereafter to make a clean neat connection, what you can do is hold the wire like this with your finger and the thumb make a J like this, make a loop like this. What you can then do is put it in the terminal and when you screw the terminal on, the connection is neat and tidy. There is really no need to take the wire round and round the terminal and that way the wire will last for a longer time in the lab and be useful for many of your friends. One of the very important circuit elements is a key. A key that means it is a switch and Whenever you want the current to flow, this will allow, otherwise no. Now let us study its design. It has got a good conductor brass broad strip here with two terminals and if you look carefully, there is a gap in between these two. So when you connect a terminal here and you connect the wire here and this is open, that means there is nothing in this gap, that means the current can't jump across, it will not flow in the circuit. The current will flow only when we put this plug here. This gap is closed and the current will flow from this terminal to the other or vice versa. So the key can be connected in any order, that means there is no positive or negative for it and you can have a system by virtue of which you can stop the current in the circuit and put it back in the circuit. There are many different types of switches like the one that you use in your home or else the ones that are used in the lab which permit you to connect 
one or two circuits together. Many options are there, but this is the simplest one which you would be using most often in the lab. Important circuit elements are resistances. These are used in the lab and you will have to recognize because their functions are different. The commonest resistance that is used is a wired one like this, a shiny wire which is made out of an alloy, nichrome. The material is chosen because it does not change its resistance with temperature and can sustain the current steadily. Now, these wires are made with uniform cross section that means they are homogeneous in material as well as in diameter. The wire is sold by standard wire gauge which is commonly known as SWG. The SWG depends upon the thickness of the wire that means the diameter of the wire. So, if you have to use a wire of a particular value resistance say for example, you want a 2 ohm resistance all you will have to do is to choose for a wire for which SWG is known that means the resistance per centimeter is known and you will take the length according to that and connect it in your circuit. Then you have other resistances which are fixed resistances. For example, this is a 5 ohm resistance, it has got two terminals, it does not mean that it is red so it should be positive because a resistance wire does not have a positive or a negative. The current can go in this direction or the other and it would not make any difference to the value of resistance. What is it inside this wire? Of course, a length of this which is coiled up so that it can sit in a small space like this. For example, if I turned it open for you, you can see this coil which is a loop made out of a wire of this type. So, providing a resistance in this particular case of say 5 ohms or 2 ohms, 10 ohms and these resistances are commonly used in the lab. Other than this, you have to have fixed resistances where you can use by choice. You may use wires much the same way, but can you imagine if you wanted a thousand ohms, the length of the wire would be very, very big and that has to be kept in a small box so that it is easy to handle. These kind of boxes are the resistance boxes in which you have two terminals and your choice can range from one ohm to about 10,000 ohms, which means there has to be very long lengths of wire. The way this works, the plug type that when you remove this plug from here, the wire of a particular value will come into the circuit because this is what you will put in the circuit. When you put it back here, the connection is through the good conductor and therefore, the resistance wire is not going to be in circuit. The current will pass through this thick metallic brass structure. To help you understand a little more, I am opening this for you and you can see very long lengths of wire, very thin wires are there which are placed in a special way. This wiring is necessary because the coiling up has to be done in a particular way. Supposing this is a long length of wire and you want to place it in such a way that it takes small space and does not influence the circuit in any other way. Other way of influence it would be magnetic influence. So, non-inductive wiring or non-inductive looping of the wire and it is done like this. The whole length is divided into half placed this way. Thereafter, it is coiled. So, as you can see, if you have this coil, the current would be flowing in any section in one direction and the closed section next to it would have current in the opposite direction. So, the magnetic field produced by one portion 
will be cancelled by the magnetic field produced by the other and therefore you have the wire offering only resistance and no magnetic influence around it. So, this becomes a very very important standard resistance box. The material used for making this is constantin or manganin again for the same reason that they can hold the resistance value at different temperatures and therefore, they become very very important. Another apparatus which is used in the lab which offers variable resistance is a rheostat. Now, notice in this rheostat you have this gray section which is a wire a long length of wire some 50 meters or so coiled up on a porcelain. This is a porcelain hollow and on that there is this coiling the ends of the wire are connected to these two terminals. Other than that there is this rod on which a slider moves and there is a terminal here. So, in effect in a rheostat there are three terminals one at the two ends of the wire and one somewhere here which is connected through this rod and through this connection. Notice this will tap the wire at any location depending upon how I slide it. So, you can connect these two if you want the full length of the wire in a circuit or if you want the wire to do a variable resistance job then you should connect this and any one of these two. Connecting this and this would mean that the current may enter here go through all this resistance wire and be tapped by the good conductor here and this good conductor offers a low resistance path. So, the current is emitting or coming out of exiting from this rheostat at this point. So, these two terminals are being used. If I use this one and this then what would happen that I have the resistance offered by only this small portion of the coil and thereafter the current flows in this section. Please note that this is used wherever you wish to change the resistance in the circuit and therefore, change the current and the choice is that you can choose it for any value of current requirement. These resistors are fixed and therefore, the current changes would be by fixed amount not the way they are in by a rheostat. So, all of them have a special use and are used in the circuits in the laboratory. In the laboratory while using circuits we need to take some measurements. So, we need instruments that will measure for us. Now, the measuring instrument has to have a principle on basis of which it works and the instrument that we are using is a galvanometer, ammeter or a voltmeter. They all work on the simple principle that whenever a current carrying coil is placed in an external magnetic field it develops a torque which means that the strength of the torque will be governed by how much current passes through it. Making use of this principle we have the galvanometer. In the galvanometer the unique feature is that it has got a zero center and the pointer can deflect to the right or to the left. Therefore, whenever in circuit and the galvanometer is showing a deflection in a particular direction and during the experiment if it changes to another side that means the current in that section has changed its direction. It is highly important because many apparatus require this kind of expertise. You may also require to know from a galvanometer whether current is more or less than the previous value that can also be shown by this. It is not going to show you a correct measure of the current, but it can show you more or less. When more current passes through it the deflection may be to the extreme point when less than that is there then the deflection may be less than that. So, the divisions over here indicate the direction of current, the amount of current and also whether current is there or not. If there is no current in a particular section of the circuit this pointer will point towards 0 
and we call it null deflection. However, if you are required to measure the amount of current which is flowing in a section, that means how many amperes is the current there, then you need an ammeter. This ammeter is a modification of this basic galvanometer which you will learn in your theory class and what you have over here is a 0 at one end and the pointer deflects only in one direction. The range of the ammeter is governed by the scale which is marked here. That means, for this particular, this particular ammeter, you can read from 0 to 1.5 amperes only. So, if there is a current value which is more than that, this particular meter would not be adequate. So, readings less than that will be read accurately by using this meter. You will also require from this not only the range, the least count of this. The divisions marked over here are calibrated in such a way that you measure accurately your values of 1 ampere and 1.25 ampere or maybe 0.75 ampere depending upon the graduations provided. It is a good idea to study the scale, read the range value, read up how many divisions are there between any of the two big divisions number of divisions there and divide that value by the number of divisions to accurately find the least count. Likewise, you may need a voltmeter. The purpose of a voltmeter is to find the potential difference between any two points in a circuit and therefore, the volts that it measures also requires a meter which will allow some portion of the current to pass through this otherwise on principle it will just not work. So, some small current is made to pass through the voltmeter and it is always placed in parallel to the points where the potential difference is to be measured and so 0 at one end and the extreme end of the scale gives you the range and like I told you about the ammeter, the graduations over here will suggest how many volts is the potential difference. So, depending upon the value that is indicated by the pointer in any experiment, you will be using the least count and the divisions travelled by the pointer for that reading and find the reading for that value. There are digital meters available as well. Those do not work on this principle. Many labs have them now, but it is not necessary to use a digital one. A digital one is the type that the electrician brings to your home and puts it in the circuit and reads off by just the numbers appearing on it and it tells you how many amperes, how many volts. Other than that, you also have a multimeter which combines the application of this and the device to measure resistance and you can use those as well. But in normal practice, separate meters are used to take the value of current and voltage.